I instructed uh, faculty who are agreeing to, uh, to come down here. And, um, and again, you know, Josh, you know, always whenever you have a course like this, the person whose home it is gets, uh, gets you know, most of the work. So Josh has, been, has done a tremendous job organizing all of this. So personal thanks to Josh as well. And to AIOM and Andrews Institute for co-sponsoring. Co uh, so the way we've uh, designed this course is mainly with an interventional and pathology bent to it. So it's it's uh, going, but we felt that we should at least have two introductory talks just to just to get everybody on the same page. So the first talk, which I'm going to give, is just an overview of diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound. And then Jay Smith will give general principles of ultrasound guided interventions. So this is will give sort of a platform from which we'll build to the other lectures. And then the lectures will be mostly lectures on pathology and therapeutics, understanding that during our hands-on workshops, we will have live models that you can scan any uh, normal anatomy you, you'd like with, with uh, sonographers and, and physicians who are really experts in that as well. So, um, so that's so that way we're going to cover the basis, and then of course we're going to be doing some uh, demos from the cadaver lab, which uh, they're looking out the AV, so that'll be all fine by the time we first start. Okay, great, so um, might as well launch into the first lecture. One thing I'd like to, for the faculty, uh, we, we all like to know who, who are we teaching to, so uh, we always like to ask, who is brand new to ultrasound, please raise your hand. And who has uh, minimal experience, just started out recently? Okay. And of those that have a lot of experience, please raise your hand. Now let's, let's see who, uh, as far as disciplines in medicine, uh, how many orthopedic surgeons in the room? Physiatry? Primary care sports medicine? Radiology? Sonographers, rheumatology. Did I miss any? Podiatry, chiropractor, PT, pain management. Good. How many pain management? Nurse practitioner. Any PAs? This is great. This is this is about the broadest audience I think we've ever had in course. Thank you, Josh. The uh, Wi-Fi. Yes. Uh, if you want to get on the Wi-Fi, there is no password. You just click on the guest register. They'll ask you for the guest network. Just click on it as a guest. There's no password. All right. We're trying to launch your few the lights. Okay. So this is an overview lecture that uh, you know I give when I give my own courses, just to sort of get everybody in the background of. Let's just go both percent in general. And uh, here are the educational objectives. So basically, after this lecture, to, we're going to talk about general applications of ultrasound in the MSK system, identify the appearance of normal MSK structures on ultrasound, and then show common pathology seen on ultrasound. If you're following along your syllabus, there are probably more slides in your syllabus than I'm actually showing here. But that's okay. Okay, so why musculoskeletal ultrasound when we have so many other tools available, MRI down the line? Well, low cost, and this is becoming more and more important in the current healthcare environment to be able to make a diagnosis in a more cost efficient manner, especially as codes become bundled and we have to do things in the most cost efficient way possible. This is becoming very important. Number two is there are very few technical limitations of ultrasound. We don't have to worry about hardware distorting the image, you know, we, we can get a really good study on mostly everybody. The next is its real-time nature, and the dynamic studies are very key in identifying pathology, but also the focus of this course, interventions, and there's just a huge number of interventions that are made possible by ultrasound. The next thing, and this is mainly, you know, for people who are maybe weren't leaned on imaging per se, is to understand that that there's better spatial resolution on ultrasound than there is in clinical MRI. So all I did was um, took the resolution at 10 megahertz for ultrasound, it was about 150 microns at 0.15 millimeters, and compared that with our standard sh shoulder protocol we use at Jefferson. And if you compute it out, it's about 450 microns, so literally three times. So you can see three times the detail 
that on ultrasound, as you can see, are an MRI. And that attribute of ultrasound is something that we use on an, on an everyday basis. And now understand that that 10 megahertz, you know, the higher the frequency in ultrasound, the better the resolution. And so 10 megahertz, we now have 12, 15, 17. Um, I will show you later a, uh, a 70 megahertz picture of a nerve. I mean, it's just getting really amazing. So, um, so this is really uh, the technological advances in ultrasound that mirrored the clinical advances as well. Now, technique is critical. And that's why you're all here to learn how to do it well. This is not something you can really dabble in and get good at it. I mean, you really have to devote yourself to learning this. That having been said, it's not impossible as it's sometimes portrayed by people. Oh, you're operator dependent. Okay, life is operator dependent. But, you know, so <laughs> use high frequency linear transducers generally. But uh, again, 10 megahertz or higher, but we often use, you know, 12, 15, et cetera. But then sometimes we do want to drop down to a five megahertz probe if you need it because of a large body habitus or a deeper structure such as a hip joint. Because although the higher frequencies give you better resolution, the thing you're going to lose is penetration. The lower frequencies give you better penetration. <coughs> so you're simply going to have to sometimes go to five megahertz, especially if you're doing a lot of hip injections, et cetera. Now there are also different tools on current ultrasound machines that can help you. One that's very important is that I find is compound imaging. Just about every manufacturer has some version of this. It's a way of reducing the speckle in the image. And just make sure if, you, if you're getting a unit, this may be something to ask. Do you have any you know, compound imaging, spatial compounding it's sometimes called? Because that really does help a lot in reducing the, the speckle noise in a picture. Tissue harmonics is uh, another tool that is present on a lot of ultrasound machines. This one it, it is not as important uh, because what tissue harmonics does is it gives you a higher, um, rather than listening for the frequency that you send the probe in at, it listens to multiples of that frequency and gives you theoretically a sharper image. But in the musculoskeletal system, we're already imaging at such a high frequency. I don't find tissue harmonics to be that helpful in musculoskeletal, but that's just another thing you might see as a selling point that the manufacturer may tell you. And then very key, have an anatomic reference handy. This is particularly important for, for people who are coming at it from the sonography side, uh, but it's true for all of us. There isn't a day, a minute, an hour that goes by without looking at Netter or some other anatomic reference. This happens to be a, a website that has some very nice primers on <coughs> basic technique and anatomy of MSK ultrasound. Uh, but uh, but there are many others. But this this is this is a particularly nice one. But don't be don't be afraid to, to look at that anatomy book because as we get better and better at this, we are being asked to look at structures that we've never even thought of or maybe even learned to begin with. So so to have that anatomic reference handy. I mean, not necessarily sit there in front of the patient and like pour through it and like, you know, what do you think? Is this what we're looking at? No, but to have it, to have it, you know, excuse yourself, you know, my mother's calling, go look at your anatomic reference. <laughs> okay, now the other thing about MSK ultrasound is, um, is you have the contralateral side for comparison. And this is critical because there's so much normal variability in the MSK system. And so somebody six foot eight versus somebody five foot two may have a very different size tendon. So we have always have the contralateral side for comparison, and that can be very helpful. Just be aware of bilateral pathology where only one side is symptomatic, and we do see that all the time. Somebody may have classic cubital tunnel syndrome on the, on the right elbow, and you see a big nerve, and you go, I wonder if that's big for this patient. You go to the other side, the nerve is just as big. They have no symptoms, but that doesn't mean this one is normal. It could be both abnormal, just only one side piece. That having been said, contralateral comparison is very helpful, especially if it's asymmetric. So here's just a simple example of contralateral comparison. Uh, just uh, you know, the painful Achilles tendon here compared to the right side. If this was the first Achilles you ever imaged, it would be probably helpful to pick up the probe and look at the other side. You can see that the tendon is thicker on this side, more hypoechoic, has more through transmission. Uh, and so you can definitely see that this is an Achilles tendinosis compared to this side. And again, we use it less and less as time goes on, but still that is a daily occurrence that we do bilateral comparisons. Now, uh, those of you who, who have a lot of experience know this, but particularly for those who are starting, the key thing is to know that each type of tissue has its own signature appearance on ultrasound. And we're gonna run through 
step by step what they look like normally and what they look like in pathology. All right, so if you look at normal tendon histology, you have pretty monotonous parallel collagen fibers, you know, and this is, this is the arrangement that we are going to be able to actually see on ultrasound. Again, on MRI, the tendon will look kind of black if they're normal. But on ultrasound, you can see this pattern. So this is a longitudinal view Achilles tendon. This is the Achilles. And you can see that you have these alternating hyper and hypoechoic lines that are in a nice parallel arrangement that exactly mimic that histologic slide. And this is a signature of tendons no matter where you are. Now, if you turn transversely on a tendon, it'll take on what uh, Tony before called the brush pattern, which are these little, it's almost like fiber optic cables. So you see the little uh, fibers of the tendon kind of cross section. They look like these little uh, dots here. And that's called the brush pattern of a normal tendon in the transverse plane. And again, you can extrapolate this to other tendons. So this happens to be the anterior tibial tendon. But again, showing that signature alternating hyper and hypoechoic parallel lines that are typical of the tendon. Now, there is a property of all tendons that we need to be aware of, and it's something that is not an issue as long as you know it's there and you correct for it. And it's called anisotropy, a bit of a clumsy word. You know, you can call it the A word if you want, but it's not clumsy. But anyway, it's a property of all tendons, and it occurs when the ultrasound beam is not at 90 degrees. You want your beam to hit the tendon at 90 degrees, otherwise when it hits the tendon, it'll bounce off into another plane, and you won't get any, any information, and the tendon will look black. And you don't want to confuse that with pathology. So the solution is you rock the probe, so-called heel-to-toe maneuver. You rock the probe to produce a 90 degree angle. So I'll show you an example. This is, happens to be my biceps tendon in my shoulder. Uh, so if, you just, if, I, if I just place the probe down, this is the tendon. But you don't see much of a fibrillar pattern here because as the beam comes down, it's oblique to the course of the tendon. So it hits the tendon, it bounces into a different plane, and nothing, the transducer, if the, if the signal doesn't get back to the transducer, it's not gonna make a picture. So it thinks that since it's not receiving signal from that area, that it's, it just writes it as black. And so now you're dealing with, is that normal or is that abnormal? Well, all you do is you take this part of the transducer, you put a little more pressure there, so that you straighten out the tendon, make it parallel to the, to the uh, transducer, and so that the beam is perpendicular to the tendon. And now all of a sudden when you hit this tendon, the echoes are to get back to the probe and you can see the nice fibrillar pattern fill in. So that is something that you will correct for just without even thinking about it after a while, but when you first start, you're gonna have to think about it. Uh, is that really pathology? Let me rock the probe and see if that stays. So for example, just a simple example here, uh, whenever tendons sort of curve down at their insertion, they can have an area that looks dark. This is where the Achilles is inserting onto the back of the calcaneus. The question is, is that abnormal? Is it not? You rock the probe and then you see it has a nice fibrillar pattern. There's no tendinous sort of pathology. Also important to understand that anisotropy occurs in transverse views also. So this is uh, uh, something that perhaps a student might be fooled by uh, doing a DDT study, seeing a couple hypoechoic areas at the medial ankle, and thinking maybe these are thrombose veins, but then you rock the probe and uh -uh, there's the brush pattern, typical of tendons. So if we go back to this, we can see that um, these were just anisotropic posterior tibial and flexor digitorum longus tendons. Now anisotropy can actually be your friend, by the way, because if you have this picture and you're trying to figure out, now let's see, where, is, where actually is the tendon on this picture? If you deliberately go to the wrong angle, it'll show you. So it can be a friend, not just your friend. Okay, now why linear transducers? We always uh, stress the fact that we want to use linear transducers, and it's just because of the geometry I told you. You want the beam to hit it perpendicular, and a curved probe will be sending the beam in at multiple angles. And if you use a curved probe, only the center of the probe will be perpendicular to the tendon and get those echoes back to the probe, whereas the, the periphery is not, and it will be black. So how can we, we can't, we can't know if that's a normal Achilles tendon, but we switch to a linear probe, and even though this is only seven megahertz, um, we still get a better, uh, much better evaluation of the Achilles with its alternating hyper and hypoechoic lines. Okay, so now that we know normal, then that's how we, 
So this is somebody playing basketball, felt a severe pop in the, in the, uh, in the ankle. And notice that we do not have that normal fibrillar pattern, it's gone. We do see some fibers here that kind of end. Then there's this amorphous hematoma here. So this is something you can confidently call a ruptured Achilles tendon because of the loss of that fibrillar pattern. And here's a partial Achilles tear, where approximately we see that nice alternating hyper and hypoechoic lines, but then as we come distally, we see this flame-shaped hypoechoic area within the tendon that kind of comes to the deep surface of the tendon here. So sort of a partial tear with interstitial component. Which then brings me to the next utility of ultrasound, which is the use of Doppler. Color Doppler has, has a number of uses in the musculoskeletal system. One of them is, is in helping to dis depict tendon pathology. Normal tendons do not have flow with them on color Doppler. And so if you can see flow within a tendon on color Doppler, then that increases your confidence that A, that really is an abnormal tendon, and B, it's most likely to cause their pain, because there's a very high correlation between where Doppler is and where a patient is experiencing pain. Now, rotator cuff will be discussed at length uh, by Dr. Rosas later uh, in his lecture on pathology. But just, to, just to show you that um, ultrasound is really the, the method of choice for the rotator cuff, but it does have a slightly different pattern from those parallel fibers that I showed you in the Achilles, because if you look at the structure of the rotator cuff, the tendons do come off at different angles to come down to attach. And so it does, it's not as parallel as the others, but still pathology is very well seen. In this case, a full thickness tear of the uh, supraspinatus tendon, and in this case, a partial thickness tear. Again, Dr. Rosas will go uh, in, in great detail about this, but just to show you that, you know, rotator cuff is no exception of having really great images produced by ultrasound. Now, a very common process that we see in, in patients is, uh, is this process tendinosis. And this is, you know, in the uh, late uh, uh, verb verbiage, I should say, I'd probably say, people call it tendinitis, I had tendinitis, 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 but tendinitis implies inflammation. It's very under uh, important to understand that most of the chronic conditions that we deal with, tennis elbow, Achilles tendon, et cetera, are not inflammatory processes, they are degenerative and this, is, this slide should be compared you know, to that slide I showed you of the nice parallel arrangement of the collagen fibers. Because in tendinosis, it's sort of a process, repeat, repetitive process of microscopic injury, inefficient repair, microscopic injury, inefficient repair. And you're left with all of these um, things on this list. So I won't read the list, but just to point out a couple things, um, because they will dictate what the ultrasound is going to look like. It's disorganized. Um, you get those random neo vessels, which explains the Doppler. Uh, you can get calcifications, which we see quite commonly, and then the interstitial tearing. So all those things together. But what again is what's missing from this list are acute inflammatory cells. So what does it look like ultrasound? Well, the tendon will progressively thicken up as it inefficiently repairs, and actually will get thicker. Heterogeneous with nodular hypoechoic areas uh, from time to time that represent the mucoid degeneration calcification may occur, and initial splitting, and then increased Doppler flow of that variable. Sometimes you'll see it really well, sometimes you won't. So here's a typical insertional Achilles tendinosis, where it's not that the fibular pattern is gone, like in that rupture I showed you, it's just that it's very heterogeneous, thickened, a calcification here, a partial split over here, and this random flow on color Doppler. So this is this is tendinosis, this is the process that we, are, we treat on a daily basis and uh, difficult to treat. Okay, and then calcifications can occur, larger calcifications can occur. This happens to be the gluteus medius in the hip. You can see this large echogenic structure with posterior acoustic shadowing. So one of the features of calcification is that it will uh, reflect but also absorb the beam such that you will lose information behind it. That's acoustic shadowing. So you can see that when you try to see the bone of the greater trochanter here, there's a little gap in it. Well, it's not really a gap in the bone. What's happening is the calcification is absorbing the ultrasound and you're losing information behind it. That's a hallmark of calcifications 
and this is just a plane from Carlet, which is so same patient showing the calcification on the greater trochanter. Supraspinatus, again, same thing, calcification with acoustic shadowing, but just I show this slide just to tell you though that if, if a calcification is soft and or very small, it may not shadow. So this is somebody who clinically had calcific tendinosis of the subscapularis and had these little bits and pieces here. Notice they don't shadow at all. So if it shadows, it's calcification, but the tiny ones, softer ones, if you don't see a shadow, don't, don't say this is not calcic because they may not shadow if they're small and or soft. And then sometimes it's just you know ridiculous. <coughs> and, you can, and, and this is this is you can you can see why you know why these these conditions can be so difficult to treat. Um, and then this would happen to have an amazing amount of value. So the body's trying to repair it, but it's just not doing it. And that's where a lot of the treatments that you're going to hear about come into play to try to get these things to heal. All right, now tendon sheets are next. So tendon sheets are hypoechoic halo around certain tendons, and they may contain a small amount of fluid. Their role in life is to lubricate the motion of the tendons. Now the Achilles is an important exception. It doesn't have a hypoechoic halo, it actually has a hyperechoic carotene. There's no sheath around the Achilles tendon. So when that sheath gets inflamed, we talk about tenosynovitis. So this is the posterior tibial tendon of the ankle. And you can see the parallel lines, and you see some hypoechoic fibers, but the main abnormality is there's a lot of this dark fluid here, hypoechoic fluid, surrounding the tendon. And when you put on the Doppler, you can see that most of the flow is in the sheath around the tendon, not within the tendon itself. And so that is tenosynovitis inflammation of the tendon sheath. Okay, now, uh, so moving from tendons now to the joints. So, Clearly the anatomy is specific to the body part being examined, and you learn the best window to see effusions for each joint. I'm not gonna go over every joint right now, we will in each of the lectures and in the demos and in the labs. But just to give you a, just, a, just a quick flavor of, of several of the, of the joints. So for example, the hip, we tend to place the probe longitudinally and we can see the femoral head and femoral neck, and then effusions will gather at the head neck junction because that's where the capsule is most loosely applied. So here's an effusion at the head neck junction. Knee joint, uh, we place the probe super patellar lead. We see the quad tendon. And then there are two fat pads, the super patellar prefemoral fat. And between them, you have this oblique line, which is the potential space of the normal knee joint. When that fills up with fluid, you get this. Okay, so this is a patient with osteoarthritis, a lot of fluid, some debris. And you can see the fat pads being split by this effusion and the extensor mechanism in front of it. Shoulders, uh, we tend to see posteriorly, and again, I, uh, we'll see a lot of this in, uh, in, in later lecture, but, um, but generally speaking, to find the shoulder, I go two-thirds of the way up from the axillary fold to the top of the shoulder, I just place the, uh, the, the probe like so, and look for the glenoid and the humerus, and fluid will collect posteriorly, lifting up the joint capsule. That's usually the approach we also take for injections coming from posteriorly lateral medial. Ankle, we sweep the, the probe side to side, and you get tibia and talus, and then we have an effusion here um, in this patient. Notice also that there is this little hypoechoic band on the talus, that's hyaline cartilage. We'll discuss hyaline cartilage later, but it's key not to mistake hyaline cartilage in the joint, which has virtually no echoes in it if it's normal for fluid. But you can see the difference because the, the cartilage tracks along the bone, whereas the, the fluid forms its own space. The patient has a lot of sclerosis here too, I probably shouldn't call him that. Anyway. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> all right, so um, now bursae. So similar to tendon sheets, bursae lubricate structures, and they're, set, they're bursae all over the body, and some have names and some don't. But the ones that we encounter most are listed here, so I'll just give you a quick flavor here. And the one that I really like to harp on is the Baker cyst, Sonographers, you all are familiar, obviously, with Baker system and DBT studies, but it's important to know the anatomy here. So it's fluid in the gastrocnemius semimembranosus bursa in the medial popliteal fossa. And Baker cysts communicate with the joint in well over 50% of adults. So you can think of the Baker cyst as a source of egress of fluid from the knee into a space. And this is what they look like, right? So we have the 
uh, semimembranosus tendon to the medial head of the gastro, and then the Baker cyst forms this mushroom shape. This is the part that communicates with the joint, and then it comes up like a mushroom. If you do not see this anatomy, do not call it the Baker cyst. You will see this 100% of the time in a Baker cyst. Another bursa that we encounter is the iliopsoas bursa up at the hip, and you might get this confusing picture where you have a common femoral artery and common femoral vein, and then see this mass behind it that doesn't really look like a vessel. Well, just like fluid can escape from the knee into a Baker cyst, fluid can, and debris can escape from the hip into the iliopsoas bursa, which then puts mass effect on the neurovascular bone. Another bursa we commonly encounter is the retrocalcaneal bursa. This is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who had quite a bit of pain at the level of the Achilles. And when we look, we see the Achilles, not 100% normal, but there was this teardrop of tissue deep to the Achilles and would flow both in the tendon and in that retrocalcaneal bursa. You can also see, if you look carefully, a little erosion here on the back of the calcaneal. So that's a retrocalcaneal bursitis from rheumatoid tissue. Now, a synovium <coughs> lines, uh, a structure that's lined with a synovium-like lining is the ganglion. And ganglia, the ganglion cysts occur all over the body. And they can range anywhere from completely anechoic, such as this one, to having debris in them and being almost like tissue in their echogenicity. So here's a, a foot ganglion, and here it is on the ultrasound. But the big difference between these two studies is that you can reach for a needle and do that if it's indicated for when you're doing ultrasound and MRI. You're probably not going to do that at that time, right? So, so again, that's the power, and that's why you're all here, is what we can do interventionally with ultrasound to take the diagnostic study to the next level. And when you aspirate a ganglion, make sure you reach for a big needle because they're very thick, 18 gauge minimum. All right, muscles. So muscles appear as hypoechoic muscle bundles separated by hyperechoic fibroadipose septa. So on longitudinal scans, they have pennate architecture, like the veins in a leaf. And in transverse scans, the starry night pattern. Getting very poetic now, I know. So here's a normal muscle in longitudinal. So we see the hypoechoic muscle bundles separated by the hyperechoic fibroadipose septa. So penny architecture, like veins in the leaf. So that's a normal muscle. And then in transverse view, if you cut those fascia in cross section, they're gonna look like stars in the sky. So that's why it's called the starry night pattern. The night being the muscle fibers, the stars being the connective tissue in between them. Muscles do have some, some anisotropy, not as much as tendons, but just beware. So this is somebody who had, a, had a pain in the, in the chest wall, and uh, I was looking at the lat, and I saw, hmm, I wonder if that's something wrong with the lat, until I tilted the probe, and then that became bright, and the rest of the lat became dark. So, so, so remember always to, you know, before you call something, make sure you tilt your probe back and forth to make sure it's real. I, well, this is real though. This patient was playing tennis and uh, out went the uh, gas drop. And so you can see that, again, you know, is there a penate architecture? No, it's not. The underlying soleus is fine, but the gastrocnemius has completely ruptured and filled with hematoma. Now this is one of my colleagues who was dancing at a wedding and she felt a pop in her uh, calf. This is about 10 days later, actually, so it's subacute, but this is the get, so, t so muscles often tear at fascial attachments. So this is a little bit of subacute hematoma or seroma that's at the deep fibers of the gastroc as they're attaching. Now, I also, a plantaris tear can also look like this, but this was actually a gastrocnemius tear uh, when you scan back and forth, and there's the underlying soleus. All right, now peripheral nerves. So this is something that is, uh, where ultrasound has become really the test of choice for peripheral nerves because um, they have a well-seen internal structure and you can follow a nerve all throughout its course. So if you know there's a neuropathy, then you're not limited to one field of view, like in an MR examination, you can actually take your probe and just follow that nerve until you see the thing that's causing a problem. So they're, uh, they're similar to tendons, they're less tightly packed, there's less anisotropy. What you'll see instead of a fibrillar pattern, you'll see fascicles that are separated by and surrounded by epinurium, and epinurium is hyper -acolic. So here's a, a histology of a peripheral nerve showing 
the fascicles surrounded by connective tissue. And this is my recently obtained picture of like a, of a 70 megahertz probe of the median nerve. And um, you know, there are some lights, it's a little light in the room, but bottom line is it's like a histologic section. You can see every individual fascicle of this nerve. And this is actually the, the palmaris longus tendon, which is not even that big a tendon, but you can, but it looks like this huge structure here. And if you turn longitudinally, this is the palmaris longus, longus tendon, which like on this image looks practically like an Achilles. This is the, this is the median nerve with each fascicle like running like a highway down the nerve. And then the, and then the flexor tendons deep to that in the carpal tunnel. And this is outrageous, right? So we're not, I mean, nobody's gonna think an MRI is gonna be as good for this as this. Anyway, so then when you have abnormalities in the nerve, what does it usually appear as? You usually lose that fascicular pattern and the nerves get more homogeneously hypoechoic. So there's a certain amount of fluid that, that usually circulates through a nerve and if you, it's like putting a dam on, you know, if you, if you constrict the nerve, then fluid will back up behind it and it will start to swell, so it'll get bigger. And the other thing that'll happen is it'll get more hypoechoic and kind of crowd out the, the fascicles will swell and sort of crowd out the connective tissue and it'll just look much more hypoechoic. So this is somebody with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, this is about twice the normal size of a median nerve. And then in the long axis, we can see why. As we follow the nerve proximal to distal, we can see there's an area of narrowing here. And that is being caused by a thick transverse carpal ligament, which is creating the carpal tunnel syndrome. And again, you'll hear a lot more about that later. By the way, uh, just this is just reminding me also to say that by convention, many of the images I show you, if not most, will be superior on the left side and inferior on the right side. However, musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, practitioners have agreed to disagree on this one. In other words, people, you show it the way you think you can show it most easily. And just the key thing is to make sure you label it properly. Uh, so there isn't one set, like every time you do a liver or abdominal ultrasound, there's set conventions for everything. But in MSK ultrasound, it's basically what makes the most sense. Because sometimes, you know, you're scanning people, you're, you're like upside down on the floor. Or whatever. And you get, you get whatever uh, orientation you can get. All right, so again, swollen nerves lose their fascicular pattern. So this happens to be cubital tunnel, the ulnar nerve at the elbow. Again, you lose the fascicular pattern when you get an abnormal nerve. But you always have to correlate it with the clinical picture since you can have swollen nerves that are asymptomatic. So this is to remind me to tell you that, again, somebody presents with, a, let's say in this case, a tibial neuropathy, and where are you gonna go you know, on an MR, well, on an ultrasound, just follow the nerve. And when you follow this nerve, you see a mass, and you see that here's nerve coming into the mass, here's nerve coming out of the mass. So now we can localize this mass to be a mass arising from the nerve. And the converse is if you see a mass, particularly a hypoechoic one like this one, always look to see if there's a nerve coming in and out of it, to see if it's of neural origin. So this is, was a neurofibroma of the tibial nerve. All right, moving on to ligaments. So ligaments are intermediate echogenous not as bright as calcium, not as dark as fluid, they're kind of right in the middle. They're, they connect bone to bone, so they're identified by the bones they connect. So this is the anterior talofibrillar ligament. How do I know it's the anterior talofibrillar ligament? Because the slide says anterior talofibrillar ligament. <laughs> because when you're looking at a ligament connecting bone to bone, it just looks like a bone, a bone, and something in between. So you have to know where your probe is. And that having been said, so here's the distal fibula, here's the talus, and you see this intermediate echogenicity structure connecting the two. And that's a nice, normal, they look similar to tendons, they have their little fibrillar pattern. Nice, normal ligament. But what we've just learned over the years is that it's not just how a ligament looks, it's what it's doing that matters. Because that ligament's job is to hold the bones together. So if you just get a static picture, it may not give the whole story. So, this is somebody who had a severe ankle sprain. Not a difficult diagnosis to make, but several months later was still having trouble walking. They got an MRI which showed that there was a lot of edema in the anterior talofibrillar ligament. You know, okay, but does that really explain why the guy can't walk? 
So we looked at the ultrasound. So here's the distal fibula, and here's the talus, and here's an abnormal looking ligament. And some fluid. Well, now watch what happens when I put some uh, plantar flexion and some Taylor tilt. The whole thing opens up, and fluid kind of whooshes in. And this is sort of a torn edge of the ligament. So rest to stress, you can see that this is a completely unstable anterolateral angle. You know, that's, that's the key information in this in diagnosing this patient. Not that there's a edema in the ligament. Okay, there's a edema in the ligament. But the key thing is that this ligament is completely incompetent. And so this patient had to have reconstruction of the ligament. It's very important with ligaments to test what they do to see if they're doing it. All right, moving on to fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage is echogenic. MRI is often the test of choice for fibrocartilage because in, in, in many joints, the fibrocartilage is too deep to see well by ultrasound. Ultrasound, though, is helpful if it's positive. Label tears, meniscal tears in the knee. If you see, it, it has a high positive predictive value. So if you see an abnormality, you can call it. If you don't see an abnormality in somebody with a high clinical suspicion, that's where MRI or MRI orthogram may be the way to go. So for example, here's the normal hip labrum. This is the acetabulum, here's the femoral head, and this echogenic structure is the fibrocartilage of the hip labrum. See how well it's attached here to the acetabulum. Now this is somebody not so normal, okay? Hip pain, anterior, an athlete, and you can see that, that first of all, the entire uh, labrum, rather than being that echogenic appearance is more hypoechoic. It's got these fissures running through it, including this detachment from the acetabulum. So this is a torn labrum. I mean, you don't need another study to tell you that this labrum is torn. So the positive predictive value is very, very good. Okay, and, um, and that can go for, for knee meniscal tears too. When we see a knee meniscal tear and it's clear cut, peripheral tear, then we're fine. Again, if we don't see it, you need an MRI. All right, moving to hyaline cartilage. So as I referred to before, hyaline cartilage lines articular surfaces and it's hypoechoic. So hypoechoic that it actually may mimic fluid. But again, you're looking for whether the, 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 the cartilage is lining the bone or if it's actually pooching out like a, like a fluid collection. So this is the femoral trochlear notch. So we bend the knee and we place the probe right at sort of the bend of the knee. So this is the, this is the femoral trochlea, and here is the cartilage, which is hypoechoic in this normal individual. Well, it turns out that we can see abnormalities of that cartilage and to be aware of them. So this was uh, somebody with knee pain. So the cartilage that we do see in the trochlea is edematous, it is actually not as hypoechoic. See, it has echoes in it. But even more importantly, there's a focal erosion all the way down to the bone. And, um, and again, because of the high resolution of ultrasound, we can see this. This patient did have an MRI previous to it. 1.5 Tesla MRI, there was some bright signal there, but again, the, the, the degree of detail you can see is, is really exquisite with the ultrasound. Bones. So you might think, well, you know, you got x-ray, you got MRI, you know, what about well, bones, don't ignore them because uh, they really can provide a lot of information. Unsuspected stress fractures, degenerative changes, and then, of course, in rheum rheumatology, this is critical for looking for erosions. So this is the first case that taught me the importance of bones. A woman who had, had been in a car accident six months ago and had persistent shoulder pain. She had uh, negative x-rays and she couldn't have an MR because she was severely claustrophobic. They wanted a center to look for rotator cuff tear. This, this case is like almost 20 years ago now. So I looked for rotator cuff tear, I didn't see one. But, she, but uh, then I asked her, where, where does it hurt? And she points to the back of her shoulder. So I just took the probe and put it down, and I saw this. This is the back of the humeral head. There's a dis depressed fracture here, unsuspected humeral impaction fracture. And the mechanism was right. She was driving, hit head on, airbag, all the whole thing, shoulder driven back. And, um, you know, you know, you know how hard to see these on a, a plane film. And again, she couldn't have an MRI. So this really taught me to respect how we could be the ones to make the diagnosis of bone pathology. This was a woman with lupus on steroids who was shoveling her snow and uh, 
and had uh, acute chest pain. So she went into the ER and you know ruled out for PE and MI and appendicitis and gallstones and and uh, you know foot ischemia and all that ruled out. But she had chest pain still. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, so somebody thought of getting an ultrasound. So this was uh, a non-tender rib, and you can see this is a cracked rib. See these lines don't meet each other, and there's a little bit of periosteal thickening around it. She actually had four rib fractures, two on each side of the chest. And you say, well, you're not going to do much about this anyway. Yeah, but she was going to embark now on this big GI workup and cardiac workup, and this, and this just stopped the workup in the tracks. And the mechanism, you know, she was on steroids, her bones were brittle, so she got rib fractures from shoveling snow. So, so it turns out that ultrasound is about three times as sensitive as x-ray for, for uh, finding rib fractures. Um, but please don't let the Jefferson ED know about that. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all over you. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so then the same thing occurs in, in rheumatology. So the, uh, the ultrasound is about three times as sensitive as x-ray for seeing erosions from, from rheumatic disease. This is a woman who had severe rheumatoid arthritis, and she was sent for ultrasound because her x-rays are normal, and the, the doctor was like, no way. I mean, there's got to be something going on. So here are her fingers. So this was the metacarpal, and there was this big erosion at the bare area of the metacarpal, all this thickening of the synovium with a huge amount of Doppler. And every finger essentially looked like this in both hands. I said, come on, negative x-ray? So this was the x-ray. And I mean, you, you just, just cannot see any of this stuff. I mean, so. And this again is in the literature that ultrasound is about a few times sense more sensitive for these erosions. So, so again, another way where ultrasound can really give a lot of information, which in this case critical information to the rheumatologist about uh, the bones of the synovium. Okay, now a few words about the dynamic examination. So pathology may not be apparent at rest. I already showed you that with the uh, anterior talofibular ligament that we stress. So basically what you do is you, um, you ask the you use maneuvers to elicit the, um, the pathology. You ask the patient to reproduce the symptoms, and then you see what's going on. So this was the first case that taught me this. Uh, softball pitcher had a painful quick while throwing, and um, it was sort of a fast pitch. So every time she came around on the fast pitch, she would feel a, click, a painful click, and it was affecting her performance. Right-handed pitcher. So this was her left elbow for comparison, capitellum radius, capitellum radius. And uh, was fine to me, all right? Explained that the x-ray was fine and everything, but she wasn't doing what caused the pain. So I actually said, well, can you mimic your fast pitch while I try to hold on, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so she gets up there, and she starts whipping her arm around. I said, wait, wait. So I sort of tried to stabilize the throat. And I said, okay, start whipping, and I'm like, and, and I said, just tell just say now when you feel the click. So she goes, now, and I go over to the machine, it, Freeze, and I said I would get back. And when she said now, her radial head subluxated out of the joint, and then quickly came back in again. And that was the click that she was feeling. So she had a ligamentous injury in her elbow, but the only way to find it was by putting her through the motion that caused it. And the only other way you could have seen this, I suppose, is fluoroscopy, but you know, no radiation and nice uh, diagnosis there. Other and you'll see these in other lectures, I'm sure, too, but uh, people have a snapping hip. You know, this is the iliopsoas muscle. This is the neurovascular bundle. Here's the iliopsoas tendon. And we have the patient reproduce a click, and you'll see that as we move, as the patient flex and extends the leg, at the very end of the motion, the iliopsoas tendon clicks against the bone. Click. And you can feel that against your probe. You feel it against your probe, and you know that that, and you see that's what you're feeling? Yeah, and if you feel it on the probe, you see it on the screen, you make the diagnosis. This is one of the most uh, classic examples that I've seen of, again, of how dynamic saves the day. So this was a, uh, a young soccer player. She injured herself, and again, it's one of these things where she wasn't able to walk. She had an MRI which showed uh, tenosynovitis of her perineal tendons. But again, it didn't explain why she couldn't even walk. So these were the tendons at rest, perineus longus, perineus brevis, and bone. Yeah, it didn't look so bad, some fluid maybe around it. Now we, we ask her to move her foot. And I have her to dorsiflex, evert, and watch what happens when she does that. 
The perineus brevis, half of it goes over the bone, half of it stays behind. The longus is moving all over the place. There's fluid all over the place. Again, this tether should be back here. And so if you just had that static image, you would not get anywhere near an idea of the kind of pathology there was there. And she had to have very major surgery to reconstruct her, uh, her ankle. Now, the other part of, of the examination, again, added value, is the fact that you have the patient there and you can correlate what you see with where it hurts. This guy was a 68-year-old senior Olympian. He had posterior foot and ankle pain, and his script said, rule out Achilles tendon care. So we scanned it, and this was not a happy-looking Achilles tendon. There was a calcification. There was an enthesophyte, which by definition is bone spur at the attachment of the tendon or ligament. They're coming off of the calcaneus and just these stippled calcifications everywhere. It was pretty straightforward. You know, I walked in the room, you know, wanted to meet some senior old man. Then he goes, you know something, they, they, they haven't scanned where it hurts yet. <laughs> so I took my fingers and I palpated the entire Achilles and there was not one bit of pain. I said, where does it hurt? And he points to his lateral malleolus. And that the lateral malleolus, his perineus brevis was split into two pieces and the longest was thickened. So I pushed here, I said, that's where it hurts? Yep, yeah, that's it. So if you were reading this, let's say, as an MRI, uh, and it said rule out Achilles tear on your script, you know, you'd probably spend this much time talking about how ugly the Achilles look, and you'd either not see this or pay little attention to it. It's really the other way around. I, I talked about a lot about this, <laughs> and oh, and incidentally noted this in calcium and in the Achilles, but this is the problem. It's nice to have that patient there. And I, now, what are the disadvantages of ultrasound oh, again? MRI again, operator dependence, but. To say that MRI is not operator dependent is an insult to people who read MRI. I mean, even radiologists who read MRI say they don't do all the time because it's not, because it's too operator dependent. And I say, what, like, you can teach, teach, teach like a hippopotamus to do what you do? I mean, there is, you know, there is some skill involved in reading an MRI too. And of course, we all know there's a lot of skill involved in reading an MRI well. I mean, you really devote yourself to learning it or you don't. I mean, it's up to you. Internal derangement of joints, that's, that's where MRI will shine. Bone marrow processes, edema, most tumors and fractures, MRI. CNS in adult spine, of course, no question, MRI is the thing there. But the advantages of ultrasound, again, every patient can have an ultrasound, they prefer these surveys, it has better resolution, contralateral comparison, you can do real time dynamic studies to bring on the pathology, you can put the probe exactly where it hurts and make sure that's where a patient hurts. Uh, Doppler capability, which gives you the physiologic information, and then the whole focus of this meeting, which is the all the great interventions you can do now that you can actually see what the pathology is and where you're going with the deal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah.